Welcome, good afternoon. I'm Kim McCoy Wade from the California Department of Aging, and I am very glad to be welcoming you back to our third in a series of really check-in calls. As you know, we've been calling for check-in calls and you've been making check-in calls. Uh, last count last week was over 1.7 million check-in calls uh, made to our older family and friends and neighbors and including by older folks too. Uh, and so we wanted to have these check-in calls uh, and have a special focus on family and friends. Uh, as we always talk about, aging is uh, affects all of us uh, as we age, as our families, in our communities, and so it really is time for these larger conversations. This is our third in our series, and uh, we are so delighted that more and more of you are coming every week. And we have a special guest here who is really a partner uh, with all of us uh, as we reimagine aging, even in these uh, dark days, as we point to uh, a bright future for our Golden State. We'll be working even closer together. So let me hand it off to uh, my, my dear colleague and friend, Assemblymember Adrienne Nazarian, to give his own words of welcome before we turn to today's topic. Assemblymember. Hi, Kim, and thank you very much for always having me and making space for me and inviting me to join you. Um, and thank you all, the panelists and participants also for taking part in this uh, important conversation. Uh, just so you know, I, I myself have been remiss in taking care of some of the estate planning that I should have. And so right when this uh, uh, crisis began, I myself started having discussions with my wife. Please don't judge me, but, uh, but I started having conversations to make sure that we're taking the appropriate steps in continuing the conversation and the work with our attorney that we had started some years ago, but we had never really completed on our estate planning. Um, I just wanted to point out something that came to my attention uh, just this morning, a, a SCAN Foundation and Hartford Foundation um, a survey that just was completed and released where 55% of older adults, uh, 70 years and plus, uh, uh, discussed that they're, they're over 55% said that they had disruptions in their medical care. Um, now, given that that's happening and we know of the myriad of reasons that also that, that took shape, Part of it also, part of the benefit that came out of this was that uh, of the 20% that used telehealth, 50% of the users uh, were content and thought that their experience was the same as in-person uh, visit. Um, so there are good things hopefully coming out of this uh, 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 crisis as well and uh, where we see technology helping benefit uh, our, our, our various populations with various needs. So with that, thank you very much, Kim, uh, for always including me, and thank you all for participating. Look forward to staying engaged with all of you. Thank you, Assembly Member, and look forward to uh, you all coming back to town virtually or in real, uh, in real time and uh, doing the, the people's business together. So thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, as we said today, uh, I can't think of a better title for this conversation, Essential Conversations, Essential Conversations. Uh, and just like the assembly member shared, I think many of us, uh, maybe this is, these are conversations that are hard to have and are easy to avoid and put off, but uh, one thing about this moment is it's, it's really brought it into focus for so many of us. And so we're so, so lucky that in California, we have leaders who are helping us all do that. Uh, and what kind of conversations are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about the kind of care that we all want, that our family members want, what matters to us the most. And how do you have those conversations? How do you think about it yourself? How do you communicate that to your loved ones? And how do you make sure that your uh, uh, providers and other medical care and other folks know those wishes? Uh, these are uh, deep, deep personal issues uh, and they require such great sensitivity and thought and planning but they also require that we normalize this and that we make it part of life. It's part of our life stage that we talk about all, all the many things, uh, whether our plans for each age and stage of our life, this is just one of those natural and normal uh, uh, points of life that we all need to talk to, talk about and be ready for. And, I, and I'll just say from a personal note, I, I, am, I am spending more time with people who um, have experienced loss from COVID, a, a loss of a loved one, 
and wanting uh, to make sure that their loved one's wishes have been respected to the most they can be in this extraordinary moment is just top of mind for so many people. So uh, I know you're on the, if you're on this call, you don't need that uh, reminder, but I just want to share how, how real this is uh, every day and every moment to us at the state and to us in our personal lives as well. So let me get out of the way and get to the real experts. Uh, again, remind you, this is our third of our fourth. We want to hear from you. So if you have questions, please send them to engage at aging.ca.gov, engage at aging.ca.gov, and we'll have time for questions and answers. Reminder, we've had two in our series already, caring for your loved ones at home and caring for your loved ones afar. They're already on our website, engage engageca.org that you can check. Uh, and next week we'll be focusing on self-care, caring for yourself when you're caring for someone else, stress relief and respite. Uh, really a, a really comprehensive series. So I'm grateful to the Alzheimer's Association for partnering with us on this. And today we have even more of our partners. Um, uh, for, I'll introduce them to you and then I will turn it over to them. Judy Thomas is, a co is, a, is the founder, the director, the leader of the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California, who really has moved these issues forward in so many ways. Uh, and Judy is also, we are so delighted and, uh, and really honored to have her on the Governor's Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Advisory Committee, the roundtable where we have been planning for 2030 and we will be getting back to that table in May uh, to resume our planning informed deeply by the lessons and experiences of, of, uh, of COVID-19. And she is joined and she'll be talking about so many of her, uh, uh, of her innovations. I particularly uh, like the phrase COVID conversations and Judy, I use it all the time. So thank you for introducing that, that phrase uh, and so much more to us. Uh, Judy's joined by Dr. Stephen Pantelot from UCSF who has also put together incredible, incredible work uh, with the team there. Uh, we're so grateful uh, for, for palliative care really being where it is in California and for uh, that we're as, uh, I'm sure there's always more to do in this space, but that we are as far along as we are in California, thanks to leadership by uh, people like Judy and Dr. Pentelot. So without further ado, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your leadership and your partnership. And Judy, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Kim, for that very warm welcome. And um, I want to say thank you to everybody who's on this call. And thank you for the work you do to care for other people and to take care of yourself. As we're seeing with COVID, caring for yourself and caring for others are really intertwined. We're in this boat together. And when you take care of yourself, you help others. And just a reminder that this is a marathon. So take it easy. And um, I, I guess this is a big pitch for um, the call next week. Uh, today's topic, um, I think I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this because I think these are very rich and rewarding conversations that um, when we figure out how to get the ball rolling, um, can really open up um, a richness in our relationship with people who are close to us and help us so that as we navigate um, with whatever happens to us and our family during COVID, um, that we're, they're, we're feeling like we're on the right track and we're doing the right thing. So with COVID, um, it's made us realize that all of us are like literally feeling that we are one breath away from a healthcare emergency or what could turn into a healthcare emergency. So the question is, you know, how do we prepare for that? Um, how do we anticipate? What should we be thinking about? What we should we be getting in order? And one of the most important ways is having a conversation. Pretty simple. You know, we're, we're used to talking all the time. All of us can talk and communicate in one way or another. So this is just um, having a conversation in the context of COVID and what could happen to any of us. And as you think about it, of course, you know, we always hope for the best. We hope that none of us have a medical crisis. We hope that none of us have to go into the hospital, that none of us need to avail ourselves of the medical system. But hoping for the best is when we combine that with preparing for or anticipating what might be the worst, when we combine that, we're in really good shape. Just as we buy insurance in case our house burns down, buying the insurance doesn't make a fire happen. So having these conversations doesn't bring the healthcare emergency. It just helps us prepare for it. And even by preparing, if it doesn't, if it does happen, 
by preparing, it won't be as bad as if we hadn't had these conversations. Because uh, if you do find yourself or a loved one in a medical emergency, you want to be focused on what's happening and not wondering like, oh, well, what do they want in this situation? It really is a gift to your family and to your loved ones to have these conversations so that they're not guessing, they're not, um, ha there's not conflict within the family because they have different opinions about what you would want. And it also gives you, it gives your loved ones a sense of control during this time that all of us are feeling quite a bit out of control because this is just, you know, too much to who would have ever thought that we would be sheltering in place and all these other things that are happening. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is give you some information and some tools about things you should be thinking about and steps you can take. So what are these essential conversations you should have? There's a term that we use that you may have heard it before. It's called advanced care planning, which is simply thinking in advance about what medical care you would want if you were seriously ill and unable to talk with the medical team yourself. It's a way to let the medical team know who you are so they can provide you with person-centered individualized care that is consistent with who you are and what you want. An important part of these conversations is first naming someone to speak for you. We call that your surrogate. And the surrogate is your voice. They stand in your shoes and they make the decisions you would make if you could speak for yourself. So they'll talk to the medical team about your medical condition, the options for treatment, the pros and cons of different treatment, and together with the medical team, your surrogate decision maker will make the decision that reflects your goals and values. So who makes a good surrogate? So when you're thinking about who you want to name in this role, you want to pick somebody who's going to be available and willing to talk to the medical team, um, who knows you well, is comfortable asking questions, able to stand up for you, and can make uh, what can be difficult decisions under stress. So it may not necessarily be the person that you would expect. It might not be your spouse. Um, it might be, uh, it might even not even be a family member, it might be a friend. So think about, you know, who would fit in that role and be comfortable doing that on your behalf. We recommend that you name one person rather than two or three to share simultaneously. Um, because the medical team really needs to have one person that is the point person, that is that decision maker, and that spokesperson. They'll deal with everybody, um, you know, as, as they can with the family conversations, but they need to have one person uh, that they know the buck stops with them. You also want to name a backup person or two. For example, if the person you name ended up um, con contracting COVID and was unavailable to speak for you, you need to have a backup person. Now, sometimes with large families, you know, it's hard to name one person. So our advice, my advice is that while you're thinking about who's going to be the surrogate decision maker, if you're worried about, you know, you maybe you have three kids and you don't want to insult anybody, maybe there's other roles to give to the other two kids. So one, one child may be the one that's going to keep everybody updated on um, you know, online and through email about what's happening with your medical condition. Another one, um, you know, might be the one that's going to help you when you come back to the house and um, be there, your hands-on caregiver. So we often have multiple people in our lives that we want to honor that could serve in this role, but think about who's best for this role and um, think of other roles for the others. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is you, you can name, you can identify, if there's people in your family that or uh, you know, that you think might show up or want to have a say, um, that you can identify that you do not want speaking for you. This is really important when you have family members who have values that are different than yours. Um, and in personally, um, with my planning, that was 
probably the key piece in there is that I have family members who are um, the ones that are most likely to have contact with the hospital I, that I don't think um, I really want them speaking for me. So um, name who you want to speak for you, name your surrogate, and then think about your goals, values, and preferences. So we can't anticipate everything that may happen with a medical condition, even with COVID. We can't anticipate exactly how, you know, we can anticipate some things, but we don't know exactly how anything will play out. And even um, in time of COVID, you may go to the hospital and need medical treatment for something that's completely unrelated to COVID. So because of that, the surrogate needs guidance that they can apply in talking to the medical team and making decisions with the medical team. And quite frankly, nobody wants any medical procedure. Like if we could avoid medical procedures completely, we would. Um, we have medical procedures, we go through medical procedures because we want to achieve a certain result. Um, the medical team tends to think of medical procedures as like the surgery is going to be successful because you make it through and the, the bone is set. Um, you know, what the, the criteria that they are looking at is medical, whereas patients and individuals, we look at uh, something being successful if it helps us get back to living our lives consistent with our values. So that's what I'm talking about here with your goals, values, and preferences. What matters most to you? What is most important to you in your life? Are you wanting um, to be able to get back home, to interact with your grandchildren? Are you wanting to be able to continue playing golf? You know, what is it that matters most? And that is different for all of us. And it's also, you know, what really gives your life meaning? Uh, for me personally, uh, my criteria is that I want to be able to have meaningful communication with the people I love. And if something happens, I'm no longer able to do that. Then for me, um, I, my life does not have the quality of life that I would like. So these are things to think about and to talk about with your loved ones. There's a couple of tools out there to help you with having these conversations. Um, there's a website, prepareforyourcare.org. Um, has lots of great information about advanced care planning and how to bring up these conversations with the people you love. Another website is gowish.org. Gowish.org. And that is actually a deck of cards, which each card has a different value on it that might be important to people at the end of life. And you can go through those cards and sort out what is most important to you and what is not important and share that with your family. And you can play it online, which is really helpful right now um, during this time of COVID. So once you've had these conversations, it's also important to document the conversation and the decisions that you've made. Now, if you're, when push comes to shove, if you're going to do one thing, whether you're going to have document or have a conversation, have the conversation. The conversation is the most important part that the people who are closest to you know what your goals and values are and who you want to speak for you. But the document helps to assure that your wishes will be honored. Um, because once you get into the healthcare system, it really helps your healthcare providers to have this information in writing so that they are sure that they're talking to the right person and uh, that they are honoring your wishes because they don't have that chance to have the conversation with you ahead of time. Um, the conversation, again, is really important also to uh, help avoid family discord, which happens when different family members have different opinions about a person's wishes. So there's two documents I want you to know about um, to help that are here for documenting these conversations and your goals and preferences. One is the Advanced Healthcare Directive or Advanced Directive, and this is recommended for anyone who's 18 years or older. So any adult um, should have an Advanced Directive, and that's the way to name your surrogate. This is the advanced directive is your own document that you're completing and you're signing. Um, and it is, again, the way to name your surrogate and make that uh, fully legal and official. Um, the other thing to put in that advanced directive is your goals, values, preferences, and those factors that you want your surrogate to use 
in making decisions and standing into your shoes and making decisions consistent with who you are. You do not need an attorney to complete this form. Again, it's completed by the individual. There's a, a number of different versions out there um, that are legal in California. The main thing is really the requirements in California is it's dated, signed by the individual, and signed by two witnesses or notarized. Um, and I'll talk about those witnesses and notary in just a little bit. Um, you can find a number of different versions, uh, different types of advanced directives on the coalition's website at coalitionccc.org. Again, coalitionccc.org. Um, there's some that are very easy to understand. There's some that are more kind of legalistic. Uh, there's some that have been designed for mental health, uh, people with mental health issues or people with developmental disabilities, lots of different versions. So find the one that really fits with you. And I just want to be uh, remind people um, that if you've got questions to please either select the Q&A icon at your Zoom, Zoom toolbar for those who are online. You'll find that Q&A icon at the bottom. Just click that and enter a question. Um, you can also send questions via email for those who aren't online to engage, E-N-G-A-G-E, -E, at aging.ca.gov. So there's two documents uh, that I wanted to make sure you were aware of. One is the advanced directive, and the other is the POLST. Uh, it stands for Physicians Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. This is a medical order, and it complements the advanced directive. So it takes those broader goals, values, and preferences that you have, and it turns it into a medical order. Um, there is one version for the state of California. Uh, it is generally on a bright pink paper so that it stands out in the medical chart. Uh, the medical order is uh, the front page of the document has all of the information about the medical, uh, your medical preferences so that um, it can be seen right away by glancing at the document what your preferences are. And because it is a medical order, emergency responders can honor it. Emergency responders, um, you know, they, they come to the home and it need to make a split second decision about what to do. They don't have the time to open up an advanced directive to look at it and try to figure out how it applies in the current situation. They do have authority to follow medical orders. And by law, they have authority to follow a POLST form. So POLST is a very helpful tool that complements the advanced directive, and it's intended for people who are seriously ill. So the advanced directive is for anyone 18 years or older, and POLST is for those people who are have a medical condition that is progressing, that is kind of in the advanced stages, that we wouldn't be surprised if they did pass away in the next year because they have such a serious medical condition. So we don't recommend POLST for everyone, only for that very specific population because um, the advanced directive is anticipating and applies for lots of situations you might find yourself in. POLST is like, if I went to the hospital today, what would I want? That's how it's designed to be. Um, because of COVID, it's a little bit larger population that the form is being used with because some people have chronic conditions that if they do con um, develop COVID, that they could uh, become seriously ill quickly. Uh, and in those situations for people who are completing a pulse form um, with their doctor, um, we recommend that that be noted on it, that it's really being completed um, in light of COVID. And so that once this crisis passes, that definitely should be reviewed as to whether it continues to represent the person's wishes. Now, POLST needs to be signed by the individual or their decision maker and a physician, nurse practitioner or physician assistant. So it really is this um, joint document developed by the individual or their decision maker and the physician. And it should be reviewed in the context of the person's diagnosis and prognosis so that we really make sure that it reflects and is grounded in their actual medical condition today. So what do we do in this days of sheltering in place and remote uh, medical appointments? Uh, with the advanced directive, 
uh, it does need to be signed to be fully legally dotting your I's and crossing your T's and then to be signed by two witnesses or notarized. Now notaries um, are developing some creative ways to do their job in the time of uh, keeping social distancing. Uh, the fingerprint pads, they do have disposable ones and they have extensive information about how to um, wipe that down and keep everything completely free of germs. So notaries are prepared to do this kind of notarization today. The witnesses can be a little bit of a challenge um, because it can't be a healthcare provider or somebody who works at a facility where the individual lives and um, at least one cannot be related by blood marriage or adoption or take uh, receive under the person's will. So most likely uh, many of us are sheltering in place. We probably don't have two people sheltering in place with us who would qualify as the witnesses. So you need to get creative on that. Again, uh, maybe by doing it through some uh, meeting on a porch, passing the document, somebody has their own pen and they sign it and passing it back. Um, if you can't do that, we also, you can call up someone, you can tell them, you know, I've completed my advance directive, I'm signing it now, um, will you serve as a witness and writing their, and you can write that person's name and say that you are writing their name in, they have witnessed it per your conversation and you're doing it on their direction. Um, so we need to be creative about that. And even if they're not properly signed, we always recommend that healthcare providers honor whatever forms they have um, because ethically and morally, they are obligated to provide care that is consistent with the individual's wishes. Um, and doctors have should know how to handle that uh, signature also during remote processes. Um, just one last thing, a little thought I want to give you is um, thoughts about, you know, some folks have started talking about a hospital go bag, and you can find out more information about that on prepareforyourcare.org. But putting together your items, just like you do with preparing for an emergency or like, you know, I was instructed to do, you know, before I gave birth was here's the stuff you kind of want to get together in place in case you need to go to the hospital uh, in the middle of the night. Um, so bring together a have a medication list, you know, keep track of a list that has all of your medications on it. Um, you may want to be able to bring those medications with you. Uh, come up with plans for who's going to take care of your pets, who's going to help you with uh, staying on top of paying your bills, uh, bringing any devices you use like eyeglasses, hearing aids, walker, bringing a phone, iPad, computer, or some other way to stay remotely in contact with people. And of course, also bring your advance directive and your post form if you have one. So again, I'd like to remind people to go ahead and submit questions through the Q&A icon or emailing engage at aging.ca.gov. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Pamplat. Thank you so much, Judy. A few years ago, I took care of Mary, who's a 72-year-old woman with a condition called interstitial lung disease, which is a chronic, incurable scarring of the lungs. <clears throat> Mary was admitted to our hospital with a pneumonia that had made her very, very sick, so sick that she had to be in the ICU so she could receive a very high level of oxygen that you could only get in the intensive care unit. And unfortunately, Mary was getting sicker, so sick that she was likely to die during that hospitalization. My palliative care team and I were on rounds in the ICU with the ICU team. We were going in to see her and I shared with the team that I thought we needed to really talk to Mary about what was really going on and we should ask her about what she hopes will happen and what she hopes for the future. And the ICU doctor looked at me and said, well, that's crazy. I mean, how can she have any hope? Look how sick she is. We went into her room and I looked at Mary and I said, Mary, when you look to the future, what do you hope will happen? And Mary looked up and right away she said, oh, I hope to see my daughter get married. We said, well, that's really important. Tell us about that. And Mary shared that her daughter was planning to get married in 10 months in the Napa Valley. And I immediately thought, I just don't see it. 
I don't think that Mary's going to live for 10 months. And I don't see any way she's going to get out of her ICU. And so we talked with Mary and her daughter about that. And we explained what we were worried about. And Mary's daughter said, well, it's really important for me too. So I'm just going to get married right here in the ICU. And sure enough, a few days later, Mary's daughter came to the ICU in this beautiful white wedding dress. And her fiance was in a tuxedo. They put a corsage on Mary's hospital gown. Our palliative care chaplain officiated at the wedding. There was family, friends, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, not a dry eye in the ICU. And it was a beautiful wedding. Mary got to achieve the things she hoped for the most and that mattered the most to her because we asked her about it. And when she told us what mattered the most, we were honest with her to say, well, if that's what you most want to have happen, if that's what you hope for, let's do that now. The COVID-19 pandemic in many ways has created that sense of urgency for all of us. Those of us with serious illness, those of us who love people with serious illness, and those of us who are living through this unprecedented time. What matters most and what do we hope will happen? I wanna talk with you a little bit today about thinking about the care we want in light of COVID-19, some of the medical issues, and then share with you a little bit about palliative care, which is appropriate for anyone with serious illness and especially in this time of COVID-19. So first I have some good news and bad news, and let's do the good news first. Um, the good news is that while this pandemic is really scary and COVID-19 is a very serious illness that can make you feel very bad and can take a long time to recover from, the overall mortality rate is low, probably about 1% or less among all the people who get infected with COVID-19. That's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is that this mortality rate is real. And because none of us have had COVID-19 before, we are all at risk for it. And we are all at risk of getting it quickly and if we all get sick quickly, we can overwhelm the healthcare system as we've seen in places like New York, Michigan, and Italy. The other bad news in all of this is that it doesn't affect people the same. And there is a higher risk of being more sick and of dying as we get older. And for people who have other serious, serious illnesses like heart disease or lung disease or cancer. If we take a step back and say, well, what is the prognosis? I've given you different numbers that overall the mortality rate is low, probably less than 1%. Um, but I also told you that age is a risk factor. The older someone is, the more likely they are to have a very serious case of COVID-19. How do we put those together? Well, if we look at all people who get COVID-19 and we look at information from all over the world, what we see is that as we get older, in fact, we are more likely to have serious complications. So hospitalization rates for people 65 and older are anywhere from about a third to 70%. Uh, and again, as we get older, over 85 years of age, the risk is as much as 70% of people with COVID-19 will get hospitalized. Not everyone who gets hospitalized ends up in the ICU, but again, older people are more likely to end up in the intensive care unit if they develop COVID-19. So for people who are 65 to 74 years old, it might be around 15% uh, of people might end up in the ICU, but people over age 85, it could be as high as 30%. If you talked about dying, if you end up in the ICU, if you end up in the hospital, um, for people 65 to 74, that risk is higher than for younger people. It's anywhere between two and a half and 5%. But for people over age 85, it's as high as 25%. So a big range, it's a serious illness, and it's something, and these, this information is important for us to know as we make the decisions. So what are the decisions that people with COVID-19 face? Well, 
it take, it's important to understand what the most serious complication of COVID-19 is so that we can understand what the decisions are. And the real life-threatening part of COVID-19 is that it affects the lungs and makes it very hard to breathe. And it causes a very serious breathing problem by causing inflammation in the lungs. The way that we try to support the body while the lungs get better is by bringing people into the hospital. Some people need high levels of oxygen, like my patient Mary did, very, very high levels. Sometimes that requires being in the intensive care unit. And when they're not able to get enough oxygen just by getting it through a mask, um, some people need mechanical ventilation. It may be something that you've heard a lot about. It's been in the news a lot about mechanical ventilation. So. I'm gonna explain about mechanical ventilation in just a moment, um, but it, I wanna take a step back and say that when we think about these decisions, the most important issue to think about is your quality of life. Is my quality of life right now such that I want to continue this quality of life? And am I willing to go through what might be very difficult and invasive treatments to maintain this quality of life or with the possibility that my quality of life afterwards might be worse. It does take a long time, can take a long time to recover from COVID-19. And I will tell you that as a palliative care physician, I'll tell you more about what palliative care is in just a few minutes. As a palliative care physician, many of the people that I talk to tell me that they've gotten to a point where their quality of life is okay, but if it got any worse, it would not be acceptable to them. Or they say, my quality of life is good right now, but boy, I sure wouldn't want to be in the hospital or in the intensive care unit or on mechanical ventilation for anything, um, given my quality of life now. And other patients of mine say, you know what, my quality of life, even though I have cancer, even though I have ALS or dementia, my quality of life is really good. And I would be willing to undergo lots of medical interventions if I could continue this quality of life. And for all of us, that's the question that we want to ask ourselves. So what are the challenges and what are the decisions in that context? Well, the first question is about hospitalization. And I think what's different in COVID-19 is that we're not allowing visitors in the hospital to protect the visitor, to protect everyone who's in the hospital, the patients and the doctors and nurses, and the people who could visit in the hospital. And for many people, the idea of being sick in a hospital but not having their loved ones be able to visit is very, very difficult. And if several of my patients have told me, you know, Dr. Penelant, in the past, I would have come to the hospital if I got sick with something more serious. But if my wife, my husband, my daughter, my grandchildren can't come visit me, I don't want to be in the hospital. Now, there are exceptions generally for people who are actively dying that their family if a family member can come visit and for other serious conversations, that's usually one person visiting. That often makes a difference and it's something worth understanding as you think about hospitalization. The other question then, and hospitalization can be for just high levels of oxygen and other medical care. But the other question is about mechanical ventilation that I talked about earlier. Remember that as we get older, we're more likely to require mechanical ventilation. And let me explain what that is. Mechanical ventilation is when there's a tube, a plastic tube that is placed through your mouth, down your throat, goes across your vocal cords and into your lungs. That tube is then attached to a machine and the machine pumps air and oxygen into your lungs when your lungs are too sick um, for you to do that on your own. When someone is on mechanical ventilation, it's very uncomfortable. Um, it's a very unnatural way to, to breathe. Um, you cannot talk, you cannot eat. Typically people are sedated because it is so uncomfortable. That's also in a setting now where visitors generally are not allowed, again, except at the very end of life. We also know that about half of older people who end up on mechanical ventilation with COVID-19 will die. Now that also means that half of people will survive, but it does mean that half of people will die. And it can be even higher than 
if you're already sick with other serious illnesses. So in thinking about that, um, the outcome is really important to understand and to understand also that mechanical ventilation is usually for several weeks with this illness because the inflammation of the lungs is very serious. So while in some conditions, um, mecha this mechanical ventilation might only be for a few days, with COVID-19 in general, it's at least a week and can be as long as three weeks or more before people, people's lungs recover enough for them to again breathe on their own. So that's another decision that people have to think about is mechanical ventilation. And then the last question that, the last decision that we're, where we talk to our patients about is what we call resuscitation, CPR. I'm sure you've seen this on television. Um, if you watch any, uh, any shows with, uh, with medical content, you've seen CPR, which is pushing on the chest to try and pump blood, electricity applied to the chest to try and get the heart to start beating again. Resuscitation is what we do to try and revive you if you die. In general, the chances of, of someone being revived are low. They're very low. Um, in the setting of COVID-19, it's even lower than that. People are generally so sick when they have this, when they die, that simply trying to revive your heart with electricity is typically not enough. Um, I would say that most of the patients we're talking to um, many of them with serious illness will say, you know, if I got so sick that I were to die, I would want to just be allowed to die peacefully at that point and not try CPR resuscitation. But that's, again, a very personal decision. So those are the decisions. Do I want to come to the hospital? Do I want to have mechanical ventilation to try that to see if I could get better? And if I died, would I want resuscitation? Those are the questions that would, are good to think about in advance and that your doctors and nurses will wanna to talk to you about if you end up in the hospital. If you're listening today, so now I wanna move on to talk about palliative care because if you're listening today and you have a serious illness like cancer or heart disease or ALS or Parkinson's disease or cirrhosis or lung disease or someone that matters to you does, please get palliative care. Palliative care can help you live better with a better quality of life and can contribute importantly to your medical care. So what is palliative care? Palliative care is medical care that's focused on improving quality of life for people with serious illness. What I tell my patients is that our job is to help you live as well as possible for as long as possible. Palliative care is not disease specific. So we don't treat heart disease and we don't treat ALS and we don't treat Parkinson's disease or lung disease. We work alongside your doctors who treat the illness that you have. And we focus on three areas, symptom management, so pain, shortness of breath, nausea, fatigue, depression, anxiety, and try to help you feel better physically. We also help you understand the implications of your illness and help you keep control over your care so that you can make the best medical decisions for you based on what's most important to you. All the things that Judy talked about earlier. And finally, we also provide support for the person who is sick and the people who matter most to you. And that can be emotional support, psychological support, spiritual support, and practical support. Who will take care of me? Where will I live? How will I get the equipment that I need, the wheelchair, the hospital bed that I need to help me stay safe and comfortable if I want to be at home? Our palliative care is generally delivered by a team, a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, and a physician working together so that we can address all the issues that really matter to people who are seriously ill and the people who matter to them. Importantly, palliative care is not end-of-life care. I think there's a lot of confusion around that. Um, it's not end-of-life care. It's for people with serious illness um, who may have many years to live, but nonetheless have questions about what's going to happen in the future, who have 
emotional or practical needs and are having symptoms like pain or shortness of breath. It can be done at home. It can be done by video. At UCSF now, all of our visits in the clinic are now being done by video to protect our patients um, so that they don't have to come to the medical center and yet can still get this care. And importantly, we can include your family members from all over the country, even all over the world on these video visits. I would say that if you or someone you care about has a serious illness, you should get palliative care. It can help you live as well as possible for as long as possible. And let me then close where we started, which was with the story of Mary. Um, when we asked her what was most important and what she hoped will happen in the future, um, she told us that it was important to see her daughter get married. And because she thought about that, because we asked about it and had an honest conversation, we were able to make that experience that was the most important to Mary happen for her. In this time of COVID-19, we're all thinking about that, all thinking about the possibility that we could suddenly get sick and even die in a way that we might not have thought about before. And I just want to share something that I think about and talk with my patients who are in this situation and something I've been thinking a lot about, which are words to say that can be very powerful. Um, when we talk to the people we care about. Um, as one of my colleagues, Ira Bayak, wrote in his book, Dying Well, there are five things we should think about saying to the people we care about, and now is a perfect time to do that. And that is, forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, I love you, goodbye. In the setting of COVID-19, um, those are the kinds of sentiments that we, we can be thinking about for ourselves and for the people we care about. We can hope that we don't succumb to this disease, that we're able to avoid it, that we're able to continue to keep the curve flat here in California and find a way through. Um, and focus on all those things that matter the most. Thanks very much. Thank and if you, you have questions, please do send them um, to engage at aging.ca.gov. And thank you. This is Carrie Graham from uh, California Department of Aging. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Panelat and uh, Judy Thomas for your remarks today. We do have a lot of questions and just about 10 minutes to answer some of those. So I, um, I want to start with uh, this question. Um, is palliative care available at every hospital? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, so mostly it depends uh, on the size of the hospital. So if you look at large hospitals across the state of California, um, the vast majority of them offer palliative care. There are some smaller hospitals and some rural hospitals that don't. Um, it's a great question to ask of your local hospital if they have a palliative care team. Um, Judy and I have actually been working together over the last 20 years uh, to help start teams and palli palliative care teams in hospitals across the state of California. And um, as I said, the vast majority do. And you should always ask your hospital. And if they don't have one, you should ask them why they don't and tell them that they should get one. Great. Wonderful. So um, another question is, um, if my mother who lives in a nursing home in California gets COVID, is there a reason to send her to the hospital or can they take care of her there? Uh, so it depends. The, the answer is it depends. It, it depends on what she hopes will happen, what her uh, preferences are about the kind of care she wants and how sick she gets. Um, you know, most people with COVID-19 won't get desperately ill and won't need hospitalization, even older people. Um, so if she's doing okay and she's breathing okay, um, she wouldn't have to go to the hospital at all. Um, if her breathing gets more difficult, um, then the question is, um, it's a question about whether she wants to go to the hospital 
um, and would want to have the kind of medical interventions. And if she does, what kind of intervention? Some people say, hey, I'll go to the hospital. I'd like some IV medications. I'll have some oxygen, but I don't want mechanical ventilation if I get that sick. And so really understanding one, uh, what kind of medical interventions you might be willing to, to undergo if you got sicker um, is really, really important to know. And, you know, just how sick you are and the, you know, the doctors and nurses at the nursing home should be able to make an evaluation about how sick someone is. And then it's really a question of, do you want to, do you want the kind of care that you can only get in a hospital? Great. Right. Um, uh, let's see. Another question is, um, I understand that if I take my mother to the hospital, I won't be able to stay with her. So we've talked about keeping her with me. What kind of care and support can I get for her at home? So a lot of uh, a lot of doctors offices now are doing telemedicine visits. So she, your your mom can continue to meet with her doctor as needed um, to, to get good care uh, through telemedicine. So that's one one way to get care. And then it really depends on the kind of care that you know that that your mom needs. Um, there are home health agencies that can come home. There's hospice agencies that can come home. There are some palliative care programs that can come home. Many of them also are, are providing care by telemedicine. Um, and if what you need is our caregivers, I will say that's been a little bit more challenging to find caregivers in this time of COVID-19, but that's also possible. Um, I do know that's, that many families have been able to figure out um, how to have caregivers come to the home just to provide um, extra help. Right. Judy, I don't know if you have other thoughts about, um, about that or other folks on the call about the caregiving aspect. Um, yeah, that's, I'm hearing the same thing about finding individual caregivers. Um, and I think that the organizations that they mentioned, Home Health, Hospice, Pantive Care, they're getting pretty creative about how they can support someone um, trying to do it as, as much through remote mechanisms um, to minimize coming into the home. And there's also some resource on the website, um, www.engageca.org. And I would specifically recommend um, calling for advice at Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, if you're looking for someone to help someone with dementia, the Alzheimer's Association, we have some phone numbers there for the Alzheimer's Association. And caregiver resource centers um, are are also there to help you. And we have all those resources on engageca.org. Um, we have another question from the chat box says, can you comment on palliative care for people with severe dementia who are in a memory care facility? Yeah, uh, people with advanced dementia also uh, can benefit from palliative care uh, for symptoms they may be having, pain, shortness of breath. Um, it's really important also to help support families um, and to help with the decision making that can come up in dementia. I will say that um, for people with advanced dementia, it's really important, but very often uh, the person who has the advanced dementia unfortunately is sometimes not able to fully participate in the conversations about their preferences. And so we do turn to family members, but that's a reason why early in the course of illness with dementia, kind of in the when people have what's called sometimes mild cognitive impairment or when they first get diagnosed with dementia and they're still able to participate, it's a really important time to engage in all the conversations that Judy was talking about and to complete an advanced directive and to make your wishes clear so that if you get to a point where you're no longer able to speak clearly for yourself, um, your wishes are known and you can help provide guidance to your family and to your doctors and nurses. And, and that brings us to another question, which is if you don't, if you haven't had these conversations, if you have no advanced care directive, who makes those decisions? Who will they ask to make those decisions if you don't have any of it? Yeah, so in California, some law, some states have a very um, prescriptive hierarchy that it's the spouse and then it's the adult child. We don't have anything like that because we're such a diverse state. We've never been able to come up with something that feels right for our state. So healthcare professionals do have 
um, legal authority to talk to the closest available relative. Um, but how they determine who that is is not set out, so they kind of, um, I, I can hand it over to Steve to talk about like how they make those decisions. Um, it's kind of like whoever, generally often who shows up. Yeah, so I, just to be clear, as long as you're able to communicate with the doctors and nurses, you make your own medical decisions. So, you know, as long as you can, you make them. But this is for what happens when you're no longer able because you're just too sick. And that can just happen from, you can be in a car accident and be too sick. You can get COVID-19 and be too sick. Um, who do we turn to? If you have an advanced directive, obviously we'll, we'll turn to that person. But as Judy said, we look to the people who know you best and hopefully know what's most important to you and what matters the most to you and can kind of represent you. You know, the people who could say, you know, I know what my wife would want. I know what my dad would want. And being able to say that really helps a lot. And that's why we encourage people to have these conversations because it's amazing um, when you talk to people, even people who are really close, people in the, in the same family um, often don't really know what, what their loved ones would say uh, and what's most important to them. And it's very interesting when we have these conversations that sometimes it's a surprise to the other family members what someone says about what's most important to them and the types of medical decisions that they would make. Um, great. So we have another question in our Q&A. Um, I have an advanced directive done as part of a trust a few years ago. Can I add COVID-related wishes to it and make it legal while social distancing? Okay, it sounds like this person has a, a legal advanced directive and they want to add to it. So I, what I would recommend at this time of social distancing is to um, write out those wishes as an addendum and attach it to the advanced directive and sign it and just make it really clear that you intend that uh, to be part of your advanced directive. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's been a couple questions on clarification on the POLST form. Um, the, acr the acronym is P-O-L-S-T and um, information about that is available on the www engageca.org website. Um, can you just say again briefly, Judy, about the COVID conversations and if they can find more information on the link called COVID conversations that's on the website? Yeah, the Coalition for Compassionate Care, we've started a campaign to help support people in having these conversations and we're calling it COVID conversations. So if you go to the Coalition website, which is simply coalition, CCC, so coalition3cs.org. You'll see it right there at the header, COVID Conversations. Just click on that and you'll get to all those resources. And then um, we have a, I'm sort of rushing through these questions because there's so many good ones and we only have about a minute left. Um, someone asks, is someone on palliative care going to be encouraged to refuse medical intervention? No, really important. No. Uh, you know, our goal is to just make sure that people get the care that they want. Um, and to help think through whether care is right for somebody. But um, we, we, th that's really our goal. Our goal is to try and help you understand what the options are and to choose the options that really are best for you. So there's nothing about trying to talk anybody into anything. Um, it's really trying to understand, hey, what's important to you? What matters the most? What's your quality of life and how can we maximize that? And if an intervention, um, will help with that, a pacemaker or surgery or chemotherapy will help you achieve your goals. We, we recommend that. Um, and if someone's recommending a big operation and you, and it sounds like, gosh, that is not what seems to be most important to you right now and will not, is not part of what your values are, we try to help clarify that as well. And then one final question, because I think this one's so important. Um, this is from someone who lives out of state and has an elderly parent in a residential care facility in California who is nearing the end of their time. They want to visit and wonder what the rules are in California that they need to follow. Um, what is the, um, generally family members are not allowed to visit in residential care facilities, but there is a exception for end of life. Judy, could you talk about that before we go? Uh, yeah, so 
to my knowledge, the state has not passed anything blanket, um, and it's up to the individual facilities to determine that. And I think it varies that facilities are definitely trying to accommodate um, those situations, but uh, to a lot of great extent, they're still um, trying to reduce the number of visitors. So I think to, there's ways to stay connected, certainly through remote visits and make those really meaningful. And um, even if we're not able to see someone before they do pass away, I would say, you know, love is stronger than even death. And I have a number of friends and colleagues who feel very close to people who have passed away um, years, uh, years ago. So we want to think about how we honor these people and who they are and have rituals even after they pass. And while they're here, you know, having really important conversations, even through a remote mechanism, um, what is, what, share with that person what was so important, um, you know, what you love the most about them, how they helped you, what you admire, uh, memories that you have, and uh, share those, those connections. All right. Well, we have uh, we've hit the end of our time today. I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank all of you who joined us today and the wonderful questions that we got. And please um, visit the California Department of Aging page, www.engageca.org, for a lot of the resources we talked about today, as well as a wealth of other resources on uh, for people caring for. Uh, a loved one during the times of COVID. So thank you all very much. And we'll see you hopefully next week on our care, get, care for yourself while you're caring for others.